this is Dustin with Dustin's Dollars. Uh, I'm reattempting my stream. I just did one and it kind of died. Um, I'm trying to again. So anyways, um, today I'm going to be talking about Next Decade and Nightscope uh, about their Q3 reports as long as all the technology cooperates. Try this again. Before I begin, let me remind you that I'm not a financial advisor or a financial professional of any sort. All opinions I express in this video are mine and do not represent those of any company or any other individual. I currently hold a long position in both Next Decade and in Nightscope, uh, so this video should be for your entertainment purposes only, because I could be wrong about everything I say in this video. You need to do your own research before making any investment decisions. All right, so sorry if you saw my prior like five minute stream where it cut out, I'm gonna start again. Um, so Next Decade reported this prior week with their Q3 earnings, and they had a nice press release here uh, you know, that came along with it. It wasn't just their 10Q. And I'm going to cover some details from both of those. One really nice bit that we got out of this is they reaffirmed their timeline for the construction of trains one, two, and three in phase one. So if you're not familiar with Next Decade, right, they are a company that is building a liquefied natural gas export facility uh, down in, I believe, Texas it is. And they got a positive FID on phase one, which includes trains, trains one, two, and three. Um, and this is three out of five of the total trains. Four and five are not, you know, under... They don't have enough sales agreements for those yet, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but as of right now, they have this positive FID on trains one, two, and three, and they reaffirm this timeline that train one is gonna be done, let's say it looks about near the end of 2027, train two in mid-2028, and then train three at the beginning of 2029. So that's really good to see that, um, see this progressing, and to see them say, hey, we're still on schedule. This is uh, one of the big unknowns when they did actually reach their positive FID uh, when you know you want to discount back those future distributable cash flows to today of how many years is it? and it was it was unclear they didn't really come out and say it. and so now that they have now we know and you know you can put this in your models and start to value the company appropriately based off of that um, now talking about trains four and trains five they do have a lot of existing options on these things so they, they made a couple different statements. You know, they they have the, the verbiage in here in their press release where they say, talk about contracting dynamics. And they're basically saying the the really salient sentences are right down here where they say, I mean, number one, these are going to be advantage, as they say, due to, you know, they're building all the common facilities and full site preparation as part of phase one. And so that makes it easier to construct, you know, phase trains four and trains five, because there's going to be a lot of common stuff that's already done and already there. Um, and they also say, we continue to experience a strong LNG market and contracting dynamics. You know, they're confident about their ability to, crest toward, to progress towards FID of these expansions, you know. And so they basically say, we're talking to lots of people and things still seem pretty good for Trains 4 and Trains 5. And so that, you know, really is a, that's the future growth story for this company. And that's just, you know, really great to see. And I've kind of talked about this in the past where when you go down and you look at their projections for distributable cash flow, um, you know, we don't have quite all the details, but you know, if you read the footnotes, they they basically say we've already factored in, you know, GNA costs and operations, a lot of other stuff here when they're coming up with this number for the distributable cash flow. So it seems pretty credible, at least in terms of what they say they've taken into account. You know, again, we don't actually know what they're modeling for all of those. You have to, to some degree, trust the company, but and so maybe you don't want to trust the company, but you know, this is the best numbers we really have to work with. And when you look at this, I think this future free cash flow or distributable cash flow of 200 or 300 million dollars per year, you know, we can kind of assume that is this is at full operations for trains one through three. And so you look back at the timeline and you say, okay, well, that is basically 2029. You can put that in for 2029. And I think you're running a, gonna be pretty close with that. You say 200 to 300 million dollars per year and distributable cash flow discount that back today you know i think a fair value for the stock today is somewhere in the four to six dollar range again not financial advice it's just kind of how i model it out you know i have a prior video if you look look up on, on my channel um i think uh updated discounted cash flow model post fid you know i think i did this video in in july or maybe august that, that kind of walked through a, a lot of different parameters and tweaking them and seeing sort of what that does to the value but yeah, i kind of came away with the conclusion that somewhere around five dollars six dollars in my opinion is roughly a fair value for the stock um today just given phase one and so when you also talk about phase or trains four and five that are going to be post phase one. You, we don't know that those are going to happen, but it seems pretty likely given you know the, the options 
that folks already have that are existing partners that they could just exercise. And that takes, a, you know, takes away a big chunk of the hurdles that they need to for Trains 4 and Trains 5. Um, you know, to me, it seems like they're likely and you're kind of getting all of that future growth roughly for free if you know if you really think that the the net present value for phase one is in the four to six dollar range you know when it's trading in the fours um and so that i think is a pretty pretty nice sort of free call option that you're getting if you purchase the stock today so that's really a big thing um in my opinion and and just just to go in one little bit of detail there that when i mentioned those those options um let me see so they, they call it out here in their presentation where they say, assuming that, you know, the, the LNG purchase options that Total has in trains four and trains five, you know, they have these options to buy one and a half million tons per year from each of those trains. And they say, assuming those options that they're already holding are exercised, you know, next decade only has to sell three million tons per year for each of trains four and trains five in order to actually, you know, have enough agreements in place to support the, you know, the debt financing that they need. And of course they still are gonna have to line up the equity partners and get that in place. But, you know, it seems like those are, you know, they've got some stuff on the table even for that too. You know, they talk about this where their existing equity partners um, have these options. Let me find the right slide that, that goes in, in detail there. So, so this is it. And they talk about who's got, you know, this is sales and purchase agreement options for trains four, but they also talk about, um, they have options to participate in the uh, well that, that's a carbon capture um i want to say this is it uh for their future options to participate yeah and trains four and trains five expansions so they've kind of got their existing partners that they had for phase one lined up and ready and they they kind of got that in place to start with already so all right let's um let's move on to a couple different things that i didn't want to say so this is one of the other unknowns that I had when they initially came out with their FID announcement. They've they've clarified now, you know, 100% where they talk about their interest during construction. It really wasn't clear where that was going to be paid from. Um, and again, this is a small note. Maybe this is just me, not, you know, my inexperience in this stuff, uh, not really knowing exactly how it comes from. But they, they were very clear. Now, if you read through this announcement, um, interest during construction, other financing costs of $3.1 billion. And where they very clearly have this already allocated in. Um, now, the one thing, the, the one big question that I have, you know, so everything I said is, you know, kind of like the the rosy view, all the optimism. Um, the big question is how they're going to fund the company next decade between now and 2029. So, you know, let's actually look at their, their quarterly report, right? They end of the quarter, their balance sheet with $50 million in cash. And, um, you know, maybe I should talk about just their balance sheet for a moment. Uh, I, what I did was I put together a spreadsheet that kind of splits out. Um, hi, Walcaza. Thanks for hopping the stream. I'll talk through next decade first, and then I'm going to move on to um, talking through Nightscope's Q3 uh, results, as long as as long as long the, the internet technology uh, continues to cooperate. Um, so you look at this balance sheet and you say, wow, that's a lot of changes. Right? If you look from December, from the end of 2022 to, you know, the end of September 2023, some massive changes, right? Their assets went up from 300 Three hundred million dollars to almost three billion dollars. Their liabilities went up from you know fifty-five million dollars, you know, basically next to nothing, up to you know two billion dollars. Um, you know, and that's because of this positive FID. You know, you look at this debt; they got a bunch of debt, and in terms of the assets, they really they've got a bunch of you know property, you know, property and equipment, and you know a bunch of restricted cash. And you're like, okay, what's you know how exactly do I tease this apart? Now, if you if you look down further in this report. They also have the balance sheet for uh, Rio Grande for the actual, um, you know, the company that's going to be uh, the holding company or whatever you want to call it. Maybe that's not probably not the right term, but the actual company that encloses um, the facility, the phase one facility. You, know, you look at this, this uh, diagram kind of shows you next decade is what you're buying the stock in when you buy, you know, the ticker next. And, you know, they there are these subsidiaries and one of their subsidiaries owns, you know, phase one of Rio Grande LNG, you know, the joint partners also own part of that subsidiary. And so things are a little complex. Uh, but as I said, they, they do split out that balance sheet, you know, so I think if I look down here, and I look at the property plant and equipment, we can see further down here somewhere. Um, yeah, so this is the balance sheet where they say, hey, just so that you can understand things, here's a balance sheet just for uh, I think this is the Rio Grande LNG. You know, they talk about this as their variable interest entity. Um, and this gets consolidated up when they talk about this balance sheet up here. 
this is their consolidated balance sheet and that other one splits it on. So I put this in a spreadsheet so that we can see the differences here. So this column, column B is the next decade balance sheet at the end of Q3. Column C is the Rio Grande, the one that I just showed you, that's their, their subsidiary that they split out. And then column D is sort of the difference where we, uh, you know, where we, this, this, uh, sorry, excuse me, column D is their balance sheet at the end of Q2. And then column E is current end of Q3 next decade if you subtract off all the Rio Grande. So this is more a true view of the next decade company excluding all of Rio Grande, right? Because Rio Grande is kind of its own thing. They've got that project plan in place, um, you know, all the debt, all the financing, that, that's what all got put together. But the question that I'm trying to answer is what does next decade, that sort of top level entity look like when you're buying you know, the stock in, in ticker next? And in particular, we can look at this and we can say, well, they've got 50, $51 million of cash on hand. You know, They don't really have any liabilities. And if we look down here, um, if you got, they got accounts payable, um, just some other various liabilities, but I mean, they don't have any debt. You know, if we look at the, this, this line for the, the debt, you know, that one point, roughly $1.4 billion debt, it was all at the Rio Grande level. You know, when I subtract that out, there's no debt. Um, you know, the, the, they have liabilities on some, some leases, but not a whole lot. And that's nice. And so their balance sheet looks kind of okay. There's just not a lot here. Um, but the question is, you know, you come down to their statement of operations and they are still burning money, right? They still have all these G&A expenses, you know, for the Q3, they, you know, at least in terms of gap accounting, you know, it costs them $32 million and a little bit more, but, you know, add it all up, it's roughly $36 million in expenses. Um, and I don't believe that they split out the operations for, for Rio Grande versus, you know, next decade. Uh, but I think a lot of this is at the next decade level. And so it's a little bit hard for me to really tell. This is a big question for me. I'm not quite sure. And they haven't really come out and, and explain this and spell this out um, of how they're going to fund next decade, how they're going to, you know, if they actually have this $35 million per per quarter in expenses for, you know, for this entity and, and, and a lot of GNA, um, you know, where are they getting the cash for that between now and, you know, the 2029 when they're going to get, you know, or, or even 2027 when I get that first train of operations uh, up and coming. And so this, I think, is the big question. And so I think, you know, if you look and you're trying to do your valuation for the company, you have to make a guess at what they're going to do there. And I think, you know, clearly there are two options. You know, they can either issue some debt at the next decade level if somebody would, would loan them the money. And I have to imagine that, that folks would, given their sort of visibility into this cash flows coming and, you know, 2027, 28, 29, and, and, and so on. Um, or, you know, and this has been the, the the path that the company has taken so far, you know, they'll just do some some stock transaction where they, you know, it, traditionally, they've done a lot of private placement deals, you know, they, they sold all these um, preferred stock, you know, I think they had A, B and C shares uh, that they, they issued at various times. And, you know, maybe they'll do that. We don't really know. Um, I'm a little surprised that they didn't, did not do this with Total when they sold for the, you know, $250 million. And I think they talk about this somewhere where they had this, you know, $219.4 million common stock purchase with, with Total Energies. Um, a lot of that money they got, you know, sort of as part of FI, the FID transactions, but then they turned right around and put it straight into Rio Grande. Um, and so they didn't actually hold on to any of this cash themselves. So again, they've only got $50 million or so on the balance sheet right now. Um, you know, at a, at a run rate of $35 million, they're going to be burning that cash like crazy, and they're going to have to raise in the next two quarters. Um, one thing I will say is I think a lot of this, maybe not a lot, but a, a good chunk of this, you know, more than 10%, I believe, is stock-based compensation. So it's not all, I think we can come down to the cash flow statement and even see that. Uh, I mean, I guess this is for nine months. Um, you know, but for, for the nine months, they had $22 million in, in share-based compensation, which probably is all in that G&A line. Um, and so it's not all cash expenses, but there is, I'm sure, a, a good chunk of it is. So, you know, that is a big question. I think it's quite possible they could issue debt. You know, I think if they issued, I mean, I hate to say it, but if, if they're at a run rate of, you know, just do the, the rough math of, uh, let's pull up the calculator. Let's say just say they're burning thirty million dollars per quarter in actual 
you know, cash expenses and they've got, you know, Q4 of 2023 and then they've got 2024, 25, 26 and 27, you know, four more years. So that's what 16 quarters called 17 quarters, you know, that's half a billion dollars of, of burn right there. Um, if they're actually spending that much. Now, the one other thing where the burn rate might not be quite so high, you know, if you, if you dig really deep into, or I shouldn't say really deep, you, you dig into this 10Q, you can see, um, so I also have a line item in here where they basically say, um, they basically say, you know, we spent, we spent $97.7 million on development activities year to date. You know, they've been funding this through the cash on hand, proceeds of issuance of equity. And they say, you know, post FID, these are, I can't, let me, let me find the, the exact verbiage, but um, following the FID, costs associated with the phase one uh, agreements and all, all, some of this other stuff um, are going to be, you know, funded by debt and equity proceeds received by Rio Grande LNG. And, you know, basically, it's, I'm not going to read through every word here, but if I understand it correctly, they're basically saying, you know what, we actually spent $97.7 million of stuff this year that we sort of will be transferring into you know, and that will become the responsibility of that Rio Grande LNG subsidiary. And so this is part of the overall project financing, right? Instead of these expenses being taken out of the cash for the next decade, they're taken out of the cash down here, down for Rio Grande LNG. And so I think it remains to be seen, you know, maybe once we get the actual, you know, 10K report and so we can see the Q4 results, that we'll have a better picture of what is their ongoing burn rate, their, their go forward burn rate going to be. Um, you know, I mean, if we, if we look at that and we see they go down from, you know, if we see this $50 million of, of cash burned down to like $10 million and we see that they actually went through $30 million in the quarter, then, you know, that's going to be your red flag. Um, not necessarily red flag, just that that's your, your that, that's the, the big blinking sign that says we need to raise money. We are actually burning through that much money. Um, you know, clearly some of the GNA is going to stay at next decade, but, you know, I'm just not sure how much. One other thing I'm not sure of is how much of this, you know, $32 million that they had in, um, in expenses in Q3 was actually associated with the FID transaction itself. You know, some of this could have been, uh, you know, maybe stock options that happened to be, you know, vesting at the time because that occurred. It could have been even other stuff, you know, legal costs and consultants, whatever. I, I have no idea, you know, just lots of other stuff that had to happen as part of the FID event itself. And so I think Q4 is going to be, as I said, a, a much, much, um, more representative picture of what is the company, what are the company's operations going to be going forward? You know, some of this clearly is still not part of Rio Grande because they have the carbon capture sort of separate piece of, of the business. And I haven't really talked about that too much in that, you know, if they, if that actually, you know, next carbon solutions, you know, that subsidiary, if that turns into anything that generates more revenue um, and profit for the company, you know, I mean, that is going to uh, be even further upside if they can do that profitably on top of everything they're doing with the LNG business. Um, oh, well, Kaza, I'm sorry. I saw you have a, see you have a comment there in terms of energy independence. It's good to have alternatives and LNGs are great. Winter states need them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, if, if you if you want to look at their view on the market, uh, you know, there's there's a, a couple different um companies put out things like this floating around. Sorry, that's the carbon capture. I'm at the wrong spot here in the in the presentation. But they have a lot of, you know, some of their analysis and they pull in data. You know, again, they source this data from Wood McKenzie. Um, and I think maybe there are some other sources, maybe not for this particular presentation. You go like some other companies. I think Shell, uh, historically, I think Shell has put out like a state of LNG presentation every year. Um, I, sh I should take a look at that. And, and, and if they have, uh, you know, maybe I'll go through it on the, on the channel sometime. Um, you know, but basically they've got just some general LNG overview uh, of the market here in the corporate presentation for next decade. You see, basically they're calling it out and saying, look, there's going to be a lot more. There's a supply gap. You know, people are going to need this. Um, and uh, yeah, there, there's a lot here. I'm not going to go through it all today, but this just helps strengthen the thesis that, you know, people are going to want to buy more LNG that trains four and trains five are very likely to happen, you know, and on top of all of it, I mean, ne next decade has, you know, some of the carbon capture stuff and that's attractive to, to some folks. And, um, you know, just in general, like LNG is, is able to displace coal. And so, you know, I think it's both less carbon and drastically less pollution. And then with some of the carbon capture, um, 
technologies that they're developing that might even be even you know even more of a positive on that direction all right um one other bit that you know if you really dig into this you can see they they call out there's a couple of things that might add slight additional upside here um and i got this by really sort of reading through you know if you look at this, this is a bunch of little little text here lots of footnotes but there's two interesting bits here um on top of just telling you how they sort of what factors they considered in the distributable cash flow number, what there's two other things here. We're one, and you may not be able to read this. Maybe I'll zoom in. Um, they basically say that there's this tiny one right here. That this these numbers do not include potential de bottlenecking that's expected to be instituted across the facility. And I think that de bottlenecking means you know what we might be able to actually produce even more than what you know the I think they call it the nameplate capacity. Yeah, so this is assumes liquefaction capacity per train is the nameplate capacity, right? So if they say it's, I think they say it's 17.6 million tons per year. Uh, I can't find it super quick, but it's somewhere in that vicinity. Um, and they're saying, hey, you know, we here it is right here. Um, if I zoom out, 17.61 million tons per year for, you know, phase one. And, you know, this little footnote is saying, you know, we've got some, let's call them ideas, right, that aren't proven out, but we think we can de-bottleneck some things. We think we can optimize some of the processes, some of the, you know, the plant itself, and maybe produce even more than that 17.61 that, you know, we're, we're calling it as, as having capacity to, um, you know, and they might have to get additional uh, approvals from the government. I think they are, they're only approved up to a certain amount. Um, but, you know, so they may have to go back to FERC and say, hey, we think we can produce even more. Can we get approved to actually export that? Uh, but, you know, just having the raw capacity there is, is really obviously is, is a positive for the company. Um, one other bit that's buried down in here is these numbers for phase one are based off of what they've actually sold to date. And even with what they've sold to date is 16.2 million tons per year. Let me... Man, there's a, that's a lot of small text. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, nope, nope, nope. There it is. Yeah. So the distributable cash flow, their projection is based on the actual SPA terms and pricing on these 16.2 million tons per year of contracted volumes, right? And so even if they don't do this de-bottlenecking, you know, 17.6 minus 16.2, that's, you know, 1.4 million tons per year that is uncontracted. If they could actually reach that full production capacity of 17.6 that's even further upside that they could produce they can sell at whatever terms they can get um you know and that's additional upside additional distributable cash flow the company will have so that i think is kind of where the company's at i sort of already talked through rough you know valuation metrics if anybody's really interested and wants me to go through you know more sort of a, a more detailed analysis, dis, uh, discounted cash flow model, or a couple of different ways to look at how you could potentially value the stock. Um, you know, let me know, I can do a future stream sort of walking through some some different things there and different assumptions you can make uh, and what that does to the valuation. Um, you know, again, I've already spent 20 minutes talking about next decade today. And so I'm gonna defer that in, until the future. Um, you know, and so if you're interested, let me know in the comments below and I'd be happy to make a future stream talking, you know, I could talk for another 20, 30 minutes just on how you model this out and, you know, how you currently value the company. So that is everything. Um, I only see Wakaz in the, in, in the chat. So, and I don't see any, any other comments or questions on um, next decade. If anybody is there and has them, uh, you know, feel free, comment in the chat. I will, I will come back and talk about those. Uh, but if, if there is nothing, no particular discussion, I'm going to move on. I'm going to talk about uh, Nightscope and about their um, their Q3 report and walk through some of the stuff that, you know, kind of jumped out at me and where where the company is there. So still don't see anything in the chat, so I'm going to move on. So let's talk uh, about Nightscope and um, a couple real interesting things, you know, right off the bat that I always look for with Nightscope. I always look at how many shares are outstanding. Let me see if I could... Uh, uh, maybe this is big enough. I think I'm already zoomed in a fair bit, 200% already. Um, so as of November 8th, so this is even past you know the end of Q3. This is in the middle of November. Um, you know, 75.4 million shares outstanding, and so you know they have been diluting. They have been using the at the money um, 
at the market. Sorry, I keep saying at the money, at the market facility to sell shares. And that is how they're funding the company. You know, so maybe I could just talk about that real quick before I go in, in a lot of details. Um, let's talk about their, you know, their balance sheet real quick. At the end of the quarter, $4.6 million in cash. You know, they really don't have any debt. I guess that's not true. They have a tiny bit of debt, $273 million. Sorry, $270,000. Wrong company. You know, the numbers here are, are much smaller. Um, but, you know, most of their debt that they had going into 2023, you know, they, frankly, they, they diluted quite a bit um, in, in Q2 and really paid that off, right? So that was a six point six and a half million dollars debt that they did have it is gone. I think it was gone at the end of Q2. It's you know, still not there. And they haven't taken on a whole lot of new debt um, other than the new bonds that they're selling. I'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, but if, if you look at this, you know, they did actually have cash on hand. Not a lot, though. Given their, you know, the burn rate, if you go down, you look at their um, statement of operations, and obviously not all of this is cash expenses, but if you look at it, for the three months, you know, they lost, let's call it six and a half million dollars, you know, I think some of this gets into funny, some funny accounting stuff, and you look at changing in the values of their warrant liabilities, um, while Kaza says Q3, you'll see they have been reducing their expenses liabilities while also increasing the revenue and margins. Don't expect perfect results for a small company, but they are getting better. Yeah, so absolutely. And that's what I want to want to, want to go through today, right? The actual numbers. Um, I was just making the, the upfront point that they are very much still not profitable and they don't have a big war chest at the moment, right? They have, you know, $4.6 million is not a lot compared to a company that's burning you know, six and a half million dollars. And, and again, this isn't all cash. Some of this is stock based compensation. Some of this is depreciation, but it's directionally correct. Let's call it at least five million. I think we could probably look at their their actual cash burn from operation. You know, they in nine months ended of Q3, they actually used 18 million dollars of cash. So it is about six million dollars per quarter if you just kind of average it out. And so the cash they have on hand is not close to enough for them to to really run the company for, you know, and I'm contrasting this, you know, some companies raise so much money in their IPO and even Nightscope was, was at this point, um, a year and a half ago, let's say after they initially did the IPO where they had, I want to say it was like $20 million of cash on hand. Um, you know, where we knew they were at a loss and, but they had plenty of cash on hand. It wasn't really worth, right. They are actually in a fairly tight spot. That's the point that I'm making. And so, this dilution that they're having and this dilution they continue to have to do even at the you know 50 cent level sub one dollar level they, they have to do to keep keep the company going um i agree with you i think they they are improving and i'm going to go through you know i'm going to go through that stuff just that be aware they are actually um they are actually still selling shares in order to fund the company well, Kaza says NASDAQ website shows 25 increased positions and now 11 new positions, just to name some Vanguard group, uh, BlackRock. Yep. Um, I mean, Vanguard and BlackRock are in everything. I, I, I discount those, right? And the reason why I discount those is because they buy those for index funds. They buy those for all sorts of different things where they're kind of, they're price insensitive, they're fundamentals insensitive, they, they buy just to have a, a large enough position to be part of their indexes to match sort of, you know, say the overall stock market, those sorts of things. Um, that's the case a lot of times for, for a couple, you know, Vanguard, BlackRock, State Street. Um, there, there's a couple of Fidelity, you know, there's a couple of these companies that are just like overall massive. I don't know that market maker is the right term. You know, they 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 have these massive mutual funds and and index funds that kind of just buy everything. And so it's not necessarily always. I guess the, the the point that I'm making with that is, it that is good and does help to some degree that there is someone out there buying the stock and holding holding the position. You know, anytime that those shares are, you know, are held and kind of locked up. You know, that that does is actually good for the company for for, for the stock. I would say um, because it sort of even if a one-off time is an increase in demand. Um, but I guess what I'm saying is it's not necessarily that they are bullish on the company, right? They're sort of indifferent on the company. They just want to hold, they want to hold their piece of basically everything um, as a part of a lot of the funds that they have. So for those holders in particular, now I have I have not actually looked, I know that a lot of the, what are the 13 Fs were reported, um, you know, because it's been like what, 45 days after the end of Q3. So all these, you know, all these funds, from you know 
everybody on down, right? All these investment funds, both from the market makers and the people who are actually taking, you know, directional positions and bets on companies. Um, they have all, uh, you know, reported those things. So that uh, I, I will look into that and, um, see what some of those other holders are of the stock. It's something I've looked at in the past. I just haven't gotten around to yet for, uh, you know, for Q3. Um, well, Kaza also says NYPD's K5 trial ends in two days and NYC has 472 subway stations. Yeah. Um, and, and we can talk about that for a minute, right? Before I go on with the numbers. I mean, this is a big deal. And this is part of my part of my thesis for Night Scope. And I think part of most people's thesis for Night Scope is, you know, the operations as they are right now, you know, the cost of, of this service and the, the able the amount of service they're able to provide is decoupled from their operating expenses pretty heavily. And right now, that's playing against them because you know, their operating expenses are very high relative to all of this. But when you have things like NYPD, you know, if they said, okay, trial went well, we like it. We want to have, as you said, they have 472 subway stations. Let's say we want to staff, you know, 10% of them, even 5% of them, right? 5% of 472 is, what is that? That's a lot. <laughs> 23 right nypd says great we want 23 robots um that's a massive growth story for the company you know i think i have rough estimates i'd say some right now they're probably around 160 or so robots deployed maybe i mean don't quote me on that i i don't know definitively it's let's say somewhere between 100 and 200 that's my my best guess um they don't really report it anymore. They they used to, uh, you know, a year or two ago and, and in the past, but they stopped reporting the number of robots, which to some degree makes sense as they've offered more and more different types. Um, but you look at that and you say, hey, we want 23 more robots. That is a massive increase. You know, I, I think they, they kind of figure it's ballpark, you know, ballpark four grand a month. Um, so it's ballpark like, you know, let's say $48,000 per year, you know, 23 robots, like, that's a million dollars of revenue right there. If they run them 24 seven, that's a million dollars of revenue right there with one client, you know, one successful pilot, one client, bam. Um, you know, and that would be a huge, right? That in and of itself would be, what's that 25% additional on their, you know, divide this by four, you know, 276 K, you know, divide that by their, their current service revenue that they got. That's just one. That's not right. I did something wrong there. Uh, oh, they need to divide by thousands. So I think that would have been a fourteen percent increase in their revenue, in their service revenue at least, just from that one client. Um, and you know, they also had this master agreement that they talked about with Penn. Let me see if I could find it. You know, Night Scope was it Penn? Um, uh, master agreement. You know, they talked about this, and this really wasn't particularly wasn't slapping me over the head obvious exactly what it meant you know but they said they they signed an agreement with Penn entertainment to offer night scope technologies to its 43 gaming and racing properties nationwide you know so they recently put their first k5 i think they had another one um i think they even even made a press release pen k5 let, let's see if we can find it um i thought they had another press release yeah so this m must be it um Two more expansion contracts for casinos. Get two additional contracts have been executed as part of a larger master agreement, right? And so, does this mean that they that Penn Entertainment actually signed an agreement to you know roll out K fives to all forty three of these? Like that is certainly what it suggests. It doesn't. It, it suggests it doesn't come out and say it particularly clearly. But this is the sort of thing that was always my you know my future facing thesis, right? That yes, Nightscope was, you know, the, the numbers certainly didn't at face value, they were massively overpriced, right? But that's because they were a startup and you and they had the potential to do things like this where they have, they sign one customer and they get 43 robot deployments out of that one customer. And now obviously they have to make the margins work on the robots. And I'll talk about that, you know, in, in a couple of minutes, but I mean, this is, this is the potential of the company. It only takes a couple of these clients and all of a sudden they go from, you know, 100, 200 robots deployed to, you know, 500 to 1,000. And, you know, wh what do the economics look like? As long as they can be profitable, you know, even marginally on those robots, you know, take these numbers and go from you know, 100 to 1,000, multiply by 10, you know, and, and really it's not that, 
I should call it out. The service revenue is is encompasses both the robot revenue and also the you know blue light towers revenue. They do split this out. Um, let me uh, see where they where it's at down here. Um, let's see. Well, I have my numbers. The qu quickest thing might just be to search for that one number here in. Q3, the ASR revenue was 1164. And so if I find that, I can show you I'm not lying to you. Yeah, so they split this out and they say our total, you know, revenue, we have it on here, but in terms of just the ASRs, just the robots, you know, was about $1.1 million for the third quarter. Um, let me just get right into this because this was actually something that I was a little disappointed at. So their overall revenue has been growing, but a lot of that has, in, in fact, pr almost all of that has been from um, the blue light tower. So if I go down, I look at the chart. I, I've, I've done this and I've split out just the revenue from their ASRs, their autonomous sec security robots, and it's growing. It's just much more slowly, right? Even from three quarters ago, they were at 920K. For this quarter, they you know, $1.1 million. You know, the growth rate is pretty muted. And I'm frankly not sure why this is. They talked a, a little bit on the town hall. Um, but it's, you know, we want to see this going up, you know, like a hockey stick. And I still think, I, I'm still, you know, maybe this is irrational at this point because I've, I've always felt like we were one or two quarters out from that actually happening. But, you know, we see things like, these agreements happening. And as you said, the NYPD trial, you know, they just have so many subway stations, you know, and you're mentioning FedRAMP, you know, the, the VA. Um, I do actually, I'm going to, I'm going to reach out to the company. And I'll, I'll let you know what they say uh, in, in terms of, you know, where they're at on FedRAMP. Cause that was, let me call this out one more thing in their Q3 report. The word FedRAMP is nowhere in here. You know, they don't talk about um, working towards that anymore. And so I'm actually not sure what's going on with that. I would have thought they've, they already would have, finished up this process. You know, they've had been in the process for this for quite a while. I, I don't have any direct experience with it. Um, and so I'm not quite sure what's going on uh, with that. I, I will um, I'll have to reach out and, uh, you know, maybe see if the company can provide an additional color on that. Because, uh, yeah, that, that is also another big part of, of the of the thesis here is that they will also start to serve the government, which is an entirely different market. Right, right now they're serving corporations. Um, and again, all of this really is one of the massive parts of the thesis is their huge, you know, total addressable market that they have with these things, especially if, you know, and I think they validated there isn't, right? The fact that they have a hundred out there deployed and they have for, you know, over a year or two proves to me that there is at least some market for these things, right? Um, you know, because it's not obvious to me that, that that's actually true. Right? It makes sense to me, but maybe nobody actually, you know, in reality wants it or maybe doesn't really work that well. But I think having 100 of these robots out there, having the people, you know, renew year after year uh, does validate the market. And so now you look at how big is the market. I mean, it is pretty, pretty massive. You know, and again, I think we're starting to see some of these things as it's really, really um, could go up quite a bit in the near future. Let me get back to some of the numbers here. So I was talking about the revenue. The revenue has grown for the robots, just not that quickly. Um, one other metric that I look at, you know, they, they report their backlog, and I guess I've got this here, their backlog at the end of October. I think this is what they actually report here. Let me find, you know, they look at the backlog as of the end of October. So this is not the end of Q3. This is as of October 29th. You know, they had a total backlog of $4.1 million, and that's $2.4 million of ASR orders, and, you know, 1.7 million, million of the blue light towers um, and, and the call boxes. But, you know, this is what that backlog looks like over time. I've charted every time they've reported it. And so it's grown quite a bit, which is not great. You know, it's good that they're making sales. It's not good that this they still have, you know, $2.4 million worth of, you know, value, again, for the robots and $4.1 million overall that, you know, if they had the, those, if they had the robots or the blue light towers and they produced them, they deployed them, they'd be, you know, generating, either generating the product revenue or generating the, you know, the, the um, the, the robot revenue from them, you know, I'd really like this backlog to go to near zero and to be a much smaller number because they're generating revenue from all these things. But one of the metrics that I actually use with that is I look at it and I say, well, if they've got, you know, if what would their revenue be 
if we took their actual revenue for the quarter and then I added on, if I looked at that backlog's worth of revenue divided by four to make it a quarterly number rather than an annual number, um, what does that total number look like? And you see, this has been, you know, trending upwards, although it's been more, it's, it's been trending slightly up even the past three quarters, but it's again, not that, not really accelerating quite yet. Um, hopefully we'll see that soon, but you know, if we did that, they'd be generating quite a bit more revenue. You know, we could predict that maybe they'd be at about 1.7 million dollars in revenue for the quarter rather than, um, 1.1. And again, this is just for, for the ASR portion of the business. And I split this out because the, the ASRs, um, I think is going to grow at a different pace than the blue light towers. And I think the margins for the ASRs, we don't really know what they are right now because they're not split up, but the margins for those as that continues to be a larger and larger portion of the revenue is going to really dominate their overall margins. <sighs> well, Kaza says in terms of upper success with Nightscope, it's not if, but when. So I, I personally, you know, I'm invested. I've held my, my shares for many years for quite a while. The one thing I will say is, you know, again, I, I'm just coming back to their cash position, right? Their cash position, they are in a fairly tight spot at the moment. You know, I think they have the potential to really grow. The big question is really going to be if they can raise enough cash to stay afloat until they can grow, right? The two, the two questions for me for the company, right? I think they're high risk. I think, let me be, be clear with, with my opinion, Nightscope is a very, very high risk, in, uh, you know, investment and, there is a possibility that they go bankrupt. So when you say it's 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 not a matter of if, but when, I'm invested. I think I personally think they will succeed, but I, I don't think it's a given. I, I, I and this is why, right? I just look at the numbers. They have 4.6 million dollars of cash at the end of September, and you know they're they're burning quite a bit with the current state of the company. You know they need to deploy that backlog because they're getting the revenue in. They need to make sure that their margins are, are positive on those robots so that the more they deploy, the more cash they're actually having come in through the door with those, you know, that they're, they're coming up with a profit in the end. But you know, if they're not able to raise capital, if something happens, right? Let's say we hit a horrible recession soon, um, you know, and capital markets really, really get bad. Like they're gonna be in a very, very tight spot. You know, they can't actually raise they can raise some by diluting, but there's a limit to what they can do there, right? I mean, their their market cap is still only at, uh, I don't know, $40 million or so. And, you know, there's a limit to how much you can actually dilute. I mean, again, I think it's uh, CEO working a second job. I love it. I love it. You know what? The, uh, wasn't he, though, right? Like, he posted this thing on Twitter where he's going to be doing um, consults. Uh, for, for founders, I'm sure that's not, you know, a significant amount of revenue, but that I, I saw that. Um, no, but yeah, the CEO work is like a job to bring in some money for the company. That'd be, uh, that's funny. I mean, look, I do think that they, they've got multiple options, right? And I think the, um, the, the debt offering that they have, right, that that's bringing cash in the door. And I, I think I went through this in the past, but they're, they're planned use of funds. There is to build more robots, right? And they're building more robots because they can deploy that backlog that that 2.4 million dollars of backlog for the robots get that deployed out and you know if the margins are good on that that's going to be you know again cash in the door and starting to get close and closer to that cash break even and, i mean it's, it's it's a virtuous cycle as well right like right now this is how things look they report q4 and they say hey our margins have improved we've deployed more robots our revenue is up that makes the stock go up right then they can do uh, dilute at a higher price and now they have effectively more options available and then and then that gives them more capital to deploy to build and deploy more robots make more sales they can get that done and then you know it's sort of this you know once they start trending upwards it can really really trend upwards so i i, I do think that it can happen um but it is high risk right that we should be very very I, I hope you're very aware of you know the current state of the company while Again, I'm invested. I think that they, you know, I, I'm, I'm personally willing to take that risk. Let me just put it that way. Um, I think there is a quite a bit of upside potential, but there is still also the potential for them. They were at, a, I would say, a very high risk of bankruptcy. You know, it's, it's even in the report. You know, they have the going concern language. You know, this is the thing where they say, um, I don't know if they, if they talk it through in, in this one in particular. A lot of these they say, hey, this is our cash burn. Um, it's usually in liquidity. Yes, yeah, so they talk about what they have. They talk about their their cash burn in the next couple of months. Um, yeah, I think they they expect negative cash flows approximately one million dollars per month. You know, for the 
for the next several months. You know, th that's really the statement from the company. Was, and you can read this whole thing where they, they, they're saying the same thing I'm saying, which is, you know, if we're not able to raise funds, you know, we'll have we'll run out of money. Right. And then we'll go bankrupt. Um, you know, clearly they have plans for that. And I, I think it's likely they're going to be able to keep raising money. But, you know, it is it is high risk. A anyways, um, hey, Trinity Sacker, thanks for uh, hopping on the stream. I talked uh, a fair bit about next decade early in the stream. I think you were one of the folks who, who um, you're interested in that company. And now I'm talking about Nightscope. It's a ro uh, security robotics company. Um, you know, if you had any any comments or questions on next decade, I'd be happy to talk about that. You know, after I get through all my all my nice good material. Um, Mark Gracie says merge with AITX. Uh, I don't think so. Um, you know, a a AITX is saddled with so much debt. I, I think that company is, you know, untouchable for anybody for from M and A uh, position. I mean, they're just like. The best thing if somebody w really wanted to to take over, um, you know, AITX would be to buy some of the debt and let the company go through bankruptcy and see what happens. I mean, I I, I just think um, you know they have so much debt on the books. I I, I don't think so, and I, I don't think that would be a good mix in terms of you know in terms of the actual products, right? I don't think there's a lot of of synergies to be had there. Um, I I just don't think that would I don't think that would work out. Um, anyways, uh, and Walkaza says never. Um, yeah, I know people are pretty polarized on that. You know, I'm not. I I, I don't want to talk about AITX too much in this particular stream. Um, I'm not a fan. That's all I'm gonna say here. Uh, that that's me being polite. Um, so, sorry. Going back to some of the numbers here. Um, I had a chart. That added in this time, um, and this really shows you. Sorry, the this uh, didn't keep my title. So this is a chart that shows kind of the impact. I put this together to show the impact of the case acquisition, right? And so this is so that they reported the revenue being up quite a bit, and it is up quite a bit year over year. Um, yeah, I think I think they named it one hundred ninety eight percent. The thing to keep in mind there is they diluted quite a bit in order to get that right. They did an acquisition. So it's not really, it's not organic 198% revenue growth. Um, and so I think a better metric to really judge the company on is what's your revenue per share. And so you can see here the revenue per 1,000 shares. This is per 1,000 shares because if you per share, it's like, you know, pennies um, per 1,000 shares. And I updated this each quarter based on the number of shares outstanding in that at the end of that quarter against their revenue in that quarter. You can see this goes back to... Um, Maybe I should zoom in a bit. Maybe that's too small for you to see. I'm sorry. Let me uh, do this. Maybe 150%. So hopefully you can read this chart now. So if you look quarter by quarter, this starts out with Q4 of 2021, goes all the way through to Q3 of 2023, right? So this is um, two years worth of data. The revenue per share did actually go up. It's come down in the past couple quarters, despite revenue going up because they've been diluting so much or because there are so many more shares outstanding. You know, the denominator is getting larger. But the other interesting bit is to look at what did this do to their gross profit per 1,000 shares? And you can see it used to be very negative. And again, this is this is not cash. This is gross profit. So this is gap. Um, you know, it's accounting numbers, which is they aren't one to one, but they're you know correlated, let's say. But you can really see the acquisition start to take, you know, what it did, where it, it took their gross profit from solidly negative to, you know, pretty much break even, you know, and it's slightly positive. It has been in, I think, a Q2 and Q3. I can't quite tell that those numbers or those, those orange bars are so small. Um, but that that really kind of gave them this base where great, they're more, they're much closer to break even. And, you know, I think going forward as the... Um, Robotics becomes a larger portion of the business because I think there's more more TAM and more or sorry total addressable market and growth potential for the robotics portion. Um, you'll you'll really see that the margins are going to start to be dominated by whatever margins they can get out of the robots. And, and well, cause I just saw you, you put on there that the machine and service business model is somewhat slow, but it works. You know, expansions and renewals is a good sign. So yes and no. So in theory, it works. In practice, we haven't seen their margins be good yet. <laughs> um, that's the one thing that I will say that that, that is my biggest, you know, again, I, I can always, you know, I can talk through good. I can talk through bad. I, I don't want this to sound like I'm bearish. I'm bullish in the company. I've purchased shares, I think, in the past three months. Um, I've been holding some shares for 
quite a while uh, and haven't sold. I, I don't think I've I don't think I've sold any shares of Nightscope ever. I've only ever added, um, you know, so that tells you my my personal what I'm you know, let, letting my money speak for it. So I'm not bullish at all on the company, but their margins so far, they haven't reached their mar their 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 uh, their model for what they want to get. Right. So if, if you look at Nightscope, right, they've got this um, Nightscope investor relations you can find their actual uh where is their so this presentation that shows you where's the actual deck yeah uh here we go think what you're referring to or and i don't, I don't put words in your mouth but the company has, has called this out multiple times and they say look this is our ideal this is how the this is how it, we want it to work. This is their, their target unit economics, right? The target where we're going to burn a lot of cash in the first year that we deploy a robot. Oh, it's not showing. Why is it not showing? It's showing on my screen. Uh, maybe it's just it's just um, delayed on my stream here, on my phone. Sorry, I'm watching myself here, making sure everything's working. Um, So year one, they're burning cash. Year two, three, four, and five, they're bringing in cash through the door, right? Um, and that is, that's their target. Now, what we've seen in practice is they haven't actually reached these unit economics, right? These are targets. They haven't actually gotten the, the cost down to, you know, $52,000 per year for the machine, right? They haven't actually gotten the service costs down to six and a half thousand dollars per year per machine. Um, I think they will get there, right? And they're they're making steps and they're improving, and you know. I, so I think I think you and I are on the same page on that. Um, but you know, th they're just not quite there yet. So the the business this is how the business model should work. And yes, this business model even is one where it's slow to see the results. And so I think at some point they're going to get here, and even once they get here, it's not going to be reflected quite yet in the numbers because because of this, right? Because the the cash burn. And the way this actually works out, where where they lose money until they it flips over and being positive after you know some lag time, um, we still haven't yet even seen it reach this point, right? Uh, that that's the one thing that I I will say that that would be my one criticism of the company. That's the one thing that I think they haven't been very transparent about. Um, and, and you know this is still on my my list of things to do. Maybe I'll tweet it out. I have actually started a Twitter account, just Dustin's dollars, I think, um, where you know maybe I'll tweet out some stuff to Nightscope and see if they they'll listen to me on you know what I would like to see in this investor presentation. I really would like to see, um, you know, them say, look, this is our target unit economics for the robots. Here's where we're actually at, right? Here's here's how much it actually costs us, you know, for, for the actual machine, for the, you know, the service that we actually, what we've, what we've literally spent on it in the past, you know, trailing 12 months or the past quarter. Here's our plans to reduce it from this to what our target is. You know, I, I'd love to see that you know, in their investor presentation. Um, I have a couple of things I really want to see. I don't, I don't want to see net dollar-based retention. I really want to see their, um, their you know, customer customer retention, maybe something along those lines. Um, anyways, let me get through a couple other charts here. Um, one of the things I track, right, they, they report this on the balance sheet and their cash flows is how much do they actually spend on robots every quarter? And you can see they had this in Q1, they really cut their cash burn. And then Q2, Q3, they, they came right back up. They've been spending record amounts almost on new robots. And this is reflected in their the actual total value. How many robots do they have either on lease or available for leasing? You know, this continues to go up, right? And so this really is kind of what I look at for their potential revenue, like their, their potential for revenue, let me say, um, for the company, right? And so as long as this is going up and, and they've got the backlog, like that just means to me that they're going to keep growing and going up in the future you know you look again at how much do they have in progress even how much raw materials you know these continue to to go up mostly over time um you know if i just same chart if i just look at it quarter by quarter and bars that you can see there like you know so this is not a stack chart anymore um you know again they have record amounts of of robots in progress of the building record amounts of raw materials on hand so i mean they are you know clearly building um you know, building for more and they're going to clear through that backlog at some point. If we just look real quick at their operating expenses, you know, they were, they ticked up a bit in the quarter. Um, 
they're still down from where they were, you know, in 2022. They have a lot of extra expenses associated with, you know, the um, associated with the IPO, associated with some some of the stuff of becoming a public company, uh, you know, some with the acquisition. But now they, you know, they've actually cut that down, and you know, I think this will probably cross your fingers. Hopefully, this will stay relatively flat. Um, you know, over the next year or two, obviously it's going to increase some, but hopefully it'll stay mostly flat. You know, in terms of the margins, you know, because as I, uh, did I have a chart that I already went through there? Um, oh, where'd it go? I used to have a chart in here. Must have, must have dropped. But in terms of their margins, you know, the service gross margins were not, you can't really see the improvement here. Um, you know, if we look over the past couple quarters, you can see in 2022, they were, you know, negative 66%, negative 70%, negative 80%. Once they had a full quarter of results from Case, you saw that, you know, drop quite a bit or increase quite a bit, get closer to zero, where now they're at negative 30, negative 28%, negative 45%, negative 35%, you know, so drastically better than it used to be. But again, this is because a lot of this is, is conflate. It's including both the robots and the blue light tower service, um, the service agreements that they have there and so this is hopefully moving in the in the right direction um you know what we really want to see we don't have the asr expenses split out and so that would give us a, a much more fine grain number and let us really see how are the robots doing right because th these quarters were the robots only you know negative negative 66 percent negative 69 percent you know we really want to see that getting better um well, Kaza says T -t 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 rich tech robotics or a lot of stuff about the global industry. You know, global industry is going to be huge, right? 293 billion for ro robots, you know, public safety, 31 billion by 2027. Yeah, I mean, again, it's humongous. Rich tech robotics in the service industry just IPO last week, still researching. I have not looked at it at all. Um, sounds interesting. Amazon entered recently in the robotic security, but it's very specific, not like Nightscope. I did hear about that and I haven't gotten to look into it myself. That'll be something I will have to research. I don't have any, I don't know anything about it quite yet. Um, and so I don't want to spend time on the stream talking about just because I have nothing to add at the moment. Uh, but yeah, that's, it is, I did hear that it's on my to-do list to research. Um, let me, let me actually note that down. I'll, I'll, I'll just try to remember it up here. Um, that I think is most of what I really want to talk through. You know, I think overall you know, the company is growing. Um, I still do wonder a little bit why the backlog's so high. You know, it seems like they've been building a lot of these robots, uh, but the backlog has stayed still very high. You know, and I, I base that on I'm looking at how many these new, you know, how much money they're spending per quarter. You know, they're spending what's this? One one point four million dollars, one point three million dollars for the prior two quarters. Um, you know, the amount of robots they have on hand just continues to go up. And so I would hope that that's going to, you know, chew through some of that backlog. I think a little bit of, of why they had that backlog and what we're going to see going forward is you'll think some of those are probably K1 hemispheres. I think some of those were probably the, the K5s that they made. And this is my, my theory. I don't know this definitively. Um, it is my guess that some of the, some of those K5s they sort of were holding back until they switched over to the fifth generation K5. And I think they've finally done that. You know, they deployed the first one at New York city. I think hopefully going forward, all the new ones will be the new generation. You know, and so I, I speculate again, I don't know, but I speculate that some of these additional raw materials and stuff that they had and a lot that they had in progress were, you know, really this fifth generation that where they kind of were waiting to prove it all out before they finalized them all up and, and got them shipped out. Same with, same with the K1 hemisphere, you know, when those are both um, shipping. So, you know, they... Yeah, I, I don't know how much more I want to talk. I'm, I've been going on for quite a while today. I can also split a lot of this in a separate stream. But, you know, they did say that they've closed some of the bonds in October. They closed 421,000. Um, should be right in here, 421,000, you know, in the bonds in October. And I think they're going to do this on a rolling basis every month where they're trying to bring in more and more um, more and more bonds. You know, they're going to use that capital, as I sort of went over in a prior stream. They plan to use the majority of that for new robots and you know presumably to get through some of this backlog and that will be really good if we can see that um you know for the future i really think you know the margins are what we need to see and frankly if they can chew through this backlog and a lot of these you know costs we still don't really have a good handle on how much of the cost of service specifically that's attributable to the robots is more like fixed costs right people monitor doing overall monitoring the fleet of robots that could monitor a fleet that's 10 times as large as well for the same cost um, 
you know, I think that really remains to be seen. It will be very interesting over the next couple quarters to see how that uh, progresses and how the margins change. So um, I think that's all I had to talk through. Uh, yeah, it's almost been an hour. So this is probably my longest stream ever. Sorry for anybody who, uh, you know, has been sitting through this and, and it was too long for them. I apologize. Um, hopefully y'all enjoyed it, got something out of it. Well, Kaza says, 50 minutes in and you did great, Dustin. Thank you. I'm doing the bonds this December. Yeah, I think the bonds are very interesting proposition. I don't usually invest in bonds. Um, so I, I, I don't I don't know that I will. Um, I, I think it is a, a it's an interesting proposition, right? I think for, it, I think it's a bit of a win win, right? I, I you know I'll I'll just throw out one thing there where I think they are actually pricing these lower or, or let me put it um, the interest rate they're paying is probably lower than what they'd have to charge or, or what they'd have to pay if they were giving these to you know traditional capital investors, um, you know because I see other companies that are let's say smaller and similar situation where they really need the cash to, to grow. And, you know, some of those folks are, are paying higher interest rates than 10%, let's say. Um, you know, but on the flip side, I think most, you know, uh, you know, I don't know that a lot of people have the ability to really, um, you know, get into these bonds at, at the price that the, the companies are, are issuing as well. So I, I think it, you know, maybe this is a bit of a win-win. I'm not, I, I have no opinion on whether they're a good investment or not. Again, I don't give it financial advice at all um, for, for anybody to tell you what I do and, and my opinions on things, but uh, you know, it's an interesting value proposition. So what well, cause says uh, thumbs up transient stacker says, I'll have to watch from the beginning to see which set about next decade. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, if you, if you have any questions or comments on there, feel free to leave them, you know, you know, go back and watch that. Feel free to leave them. Um, if you don't have any particular right now, obviously if you had some right now, we have to talk to you about it. Uh, but if not, you know, feel free to leave it. I could, I can do a future stream on next decade. If I get a couple questions or comments, I'd be happy to, to talk about the stuff. Um, I'm going to try to keep these streams on, on Sundays, um, you know, w with next week being Thanksgiving, uh, I may or may not be able to do it on Sunday. We'll, we'll see. Um, I'm going to try. And, and again, most of the time I'm going to try to be in the afternoon again in, um, Eastern U S time today, personal circumstances didn't let that happen. So I'm, I'm obviously much later, uh, but I'm going to try to keep Sunday as many weeks as I can. So that is hopefully we can get a regular thing going and have some, some folks on here. Um, well, Kaza says it's my only risk investment in uh, KSAP. Um, my only risk investment. Uh, well, because it says Mahalo. Uh, yeah. So, um, all right. I'm going to hop off. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Wakaza, for for all the, the conversation. Um, I don't know who else is there. Mark, Mark Gracie, Transit Stacker. Really appreciate everybody being on here. Um, yeah. It, it, again, it, I, I'm going to hop off. I think if you have any other questions or comments and, and I miss it, you didn't quite get to it on the stream, feel free to leave it on the video. I can, um, you know, I'll respond to you down in the, in the comments. Um, or you know, on my, on my YouTube profile, I think my email address is on there. Y'all be able to you know, send it to me if you want to reach out. I'm happy to to chat there. So, all right.